Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Councillor Stephen Holliday. I'm the chair of the Etobicoke York Community Council. We have quorum. I'm now calling meeting five to order. Welcome, everyone. Today's meeting is being held with uh, members of council and city staff, both by video conference and in person at the Etobicoke Civic Center in the council chamber. The Etobicoke Civic Center is open to the public and anyone is welcome to attend the meeting today. The public may continue to participate electronically by video conference. This meeting is also being live streamed online at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. The list of speakers can be viewed online by visiting the Etobicoke York Community Council page at toronto.ca slash council and clicking the speakers box for today's meeting. If you are registered to speak at today's meeting, please listen for me to call your name. I will call speakers in the order they appear on the list. I ask everyone for their patience with any delays and technical issues. Members, the city clerk has provided all agenda materials on toronto.ca slash council and on the CMP, the clerk's meeting portal. Clerk's IT staff are available to members if you need help with your devices. When voting on an item or a motion, I ask that members ensure that they turn on their video and to raise their hand to indicate their vote. Members, I want to remind you to please submit and approve your motions by email. Staff are available at etcc at toronto.ca to help with motions. Although we may be meeting in different locations today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto was covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? If you do have an interest, please raise your hand or unmute your mic and indicate the item number and the nature of your interest. Seeing none, we will proceed. May I have a motion to confirm the minutes from our meeting on April 3rd, 2023? Councillor Morley moves. All those in favour, any opposed, that is carried. Great, thank you. We can now go through the adi through the agenda items. EY 5.1 4500 Jane Street Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application Decision Report Approval uh, that is being held for speakers. Hold that in my name. EY 5.2, 14, 18, 24, and 26 Jopling Avenue South, residential demolition application. Uh, that's held for speakers in my name. EY 5.3, 150 Hillside Avenue, application to remove a city tree. Uh, there are no speakers for that, so Councillor Morley? I'll move second. Uh, sorry, the uh, Indigenous people. Of the... Ah, Okay. Councillor Morley moves alternate recommendations uh, to remove the tree. Motion's on the screen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, moving that a typical York Community Council approve the request for a permit to remove one city-owned tree located at 150 Hillside Avenue, conditional upon uh, the conditions listed in the motion. Um, my team has been working with the homeowner, and uh, unfortunately, this is one that... Um, is very prohibitive to the necessary work on site. Um, so we're going to be going forward with that. Thank okay. you. Councillor Morley moves alternate recommendations. All those in favor? Any opposed? That item is carried. EY 5.4 19 Dyson Court application to remove a private tree. Councillor Crisanti has passed a message and asked me to hold that in my name. And there are speakers for that, for that item. EY 5.5 5 Verona Avenue application to remove two city trees. There are speakers in that item, so I'll hold it in my name. EY 5.6, 92 North Drive, application to remove three city trees. There are speakers in that item, I'll hold it in my name. EY 5.7, uh, 23 Buckingham Street, naming of a proposed private street for a development. Councillor Morley. Uh, I'd like to move the staff recommendations to approve the naming. Councillor Morley moves the staff recommendations. All those in favor, any opposed, that item is carried. EY 5.8, 
Eltham Drive and Delma Drive always stop control. Councillor Morley. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and move uh, the approval. Councillor Morley moves the staff recommendations. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. EY 5.9 compulsory stop control the Elms at Vista Humber Drive. Um, that's Councillor Crisanti's. I'm going to just hold that in my name. I know Councillor Crisanti should be here in a moment. EY 5.10. Uh, Woodstream Drive, parking amendments and heavy truck prohibition, Councillor Crisanti, uh, that's his item. I'm going to hold that in my name. He should be here in a moment. Thank you. EY 5.11, uh, Chalk Farm Drive, parking amendments, Councillor Peruzza. Councillor Peruzza moves the staff recommendations. All those in favor? Any opposed? That item carries. EY 5.12, Gilpin Avenue, introduction of overnight on-street parking excuse me, on-street permit parking. Councillor Nunziata. Yes, I'll move, um, I'll move the uh, staff recommendation. Councillor Nunziata moves the staff recommendations. All those in favor, any opposed, that carries. EY 5.13, Hertford Avenue, introduction of overnight on-street permit parking. Councillor Nunziata. Yes, I'll move the staff recommendation. Councillor Nunziata moves the staff recommendations. All those in favor, any opposed, that item carries. EY 5.14, snowplow damage to sod along sidewalks and other landscape features within the road right of way, Councillor Crisanti, let me know. Uh, he had a motion for that, so I'm going to hold that in my name. Yes, and I have a question questions, as well. Questions, be questions as well. Okay. EY 5.15 grant of easement to Cloverdale Mall Inc. for airspace surrounding a bridge owned by Cloverdale over the East Mall. EY 5.15, uh, Councillor Morley. I'm moving approval. Councillor Morley moves approval of the staff recommendations. All those in favor? Any opposed? That item is carried. EY 5.16, removal of a director from the Weston Village Business Improvement Area Board of Management. Councillor Nunziata. Yes, I'll move the recommendation. Councillor Nunziata moves the recommendations. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. And we have a add-on today. Um, we just need a motion to add new business uh, from Councillor Peruzza. Uh, this is the no stopping. Motion to add new business, Councillor Peruzza. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. That will be item number 17. Okay. We'll go back up to the top of the list. EY 5.1. Um, excuse me. EY 5.1, 4500 Jane Street, Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application Decision Report Approval. Uh, we have one speaker, Lindsay Dale Harris Bous from Bousefields. Great. Good morning, Lindsay. Can you hear us? And here at Stephen Holliday, the chair of the Etobicoke York Community Council. Can you hear me now? Yes, very well. Welcome to the Etobicoke York very Community good. Council. Uh, you have five minutes. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you. I'm going to be very brief. I am Lindsay Dale Harris. I'm a partner with Bowsfields, and we are the planning consultants for uh, Starlight. And uh, there are actually representatives from Starlight in live, in person, in the uh, council chamber today. And I know you have a very busy agenda, and so I will be very brief. Um, uh, as you know, 4500 Jane Street is located on the west side of Jane. It's north of Finch, and it's east of Gosford Boulevard, and it's designated apartment neighborhood. We are proposing, Starlight is proposing to, to, late, to locate two six-story apartment buildings in an area currently used for surface parking and an outdoor swimming pool to retain the existing building and provide most of the parking underground and to provide really extensive landscaping throughout the site uh, and providing a very attractive Pops Plaza, and they are going to provide 135 new rental units. We have read the staff report, we're in full support report and the recommendations for the improvement to the existing building. Questions, we, I'd be pleased to answer them, and um, 
that's all I have to say to the uh, Council Committee today. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you for joining us. Uh, questions of staff? Seeing none, I'll take it into committee. Um, anyone like to speak? Councillor Nunziata. Thank you. Um, so, and, and thank you for the pr uh, brief presentation. We're not used to these brief presentations. Um, uh, thank you very much. And um, I, I would like to move the staff recommendation. I, I think it's a good project. And um, I, I don't believe, um, I mean, we don't have any um, uh, deputations this morning other than the applicant. And uh, so I would just like to move the recommendation. Councillor Nunziata moves the staff recommendations. All those in favor, any opposed, that item carries. Thank you, we are on to the second item. That is EY 5.2, 14, 18, 24, and 26, Jopling Avenue South, residential demolition application. Our speaker today is uh, Peter Jacob Civic from Tribute. Morning, Peter. Welcome to the Etobicoke York Community Council. Uh, you've got five minutes. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair, members of Council. Uh, Peter Jackwood from the Tribute Community. Uh, I'm here in support of the application for demolition. Uh, we purchased this site uh, last year, closed in October. Uh, there's nine uh, buildings, structures on the property. Of the nine, four, I, four are identified as residential and that's why we're here today uh, seeking, I guess, approval with conditions, and those conditions are acceptable. Uh, we do have intention on um, demoing uh, and cleaning up the property uh, this June, preferably as soon as possible, and we will be submitting for a hoarding application uh, to at least provide the screening with 50% with public art uh, as soon as possible. So if you have any questions, um, I'm here to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions of the speaker? Councilor Nunziata. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, I'm pleased that you mentioned public art. So have you been um, in dialogue with any of the arts groups in, in the area for the uh, artwork on the? Uh, thank you, Councilor Fee, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have not as of yet. We okay. are seeking a local artist in order to participate and provide uh, predominantly photography, unless there's some other opportunity. Uh, we've been working on a number of sites in North York, in particular in downtown, where we've worked with select artists that are specific to an area to capture, you know, if it is photography, capture the essence of and the fabric of, of the community itself. If it's public art, it's, uh, it's a selective call. But we'll work with staff and with the local councillor to, uh, to make that selection. Right. Uh, the, the proper process to bring them on board and deliver something that you know we hope will will remain during the course of, yeah. of the interim period leading up to hopefully knock on wood you know we'll have a good sales launch come July and we'll see how the market is and, and uh, have a shovel in the ground as soon as possible well I, I'm yeah I'm pleased because I, I like to see public art on some of these hoardings and some of uh, I encourage that in my ward as well because what you don't want to see is just a board up and uh, then you get graffiti and you get everything else on them. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Are there any questions of staff? Any members wishing to speak? Councillor Morley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the debutant for being here today. Uh, it's great to see the team. I'd like to move. Um, Number three of the staff recommendations, there is a slight um, uh, amendment to be made. We are going to remove the requirement for sod replacement because we are going to have that fenced off and we're really glad the applicant is amenable to the artistic hoarding. Um, so our office is looking forward to working uh, with them on that. Um, so we'll just include um, staff recommendation number three with the deletion of sod um, for replacement as it'll be under construction short order, uh, and including artistic hoarding uh, as part of the um, recommendation. And thank you to clerks for uh, your support with that. Yeah. 
Thank you. Okay, we're just going to hold that down just to uh, make an adjustment to the wording of the motion. Thank you, Councillor Morley. Any other members wishing to speak before we move on? Okay, we'll hold that for a sec. Uh, we will go on to the next item, which is EY 5.419 Dyson Court application to remove a private tree. Uh, there are speakers on this item. And uh, the speaker I have listed is Eleanor Cheka uh, via yes, good morning. video conference. Eleanor, can you, it's Stephen Holliday from the Etobicoke York Community Council. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Could you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. And we can see you as well. Um, okay. Welcome to the Community Council. You have five minutes to speak. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here. My mother, Carolina Tadeo, she is the homeowner of 19 Disincourt. She's present with me right here. It's regarding um, the removal of a large spruce tree in front of her house. Uh, she understands it's a healthy tree, but it, it's the close proximity to her house. Um, and it's growing like over her roof. It's about eight feet away from her home. Uh, her gutters get filled um, with needles and it has to be cleaned multiple times a year and she even has difficulty getting something to clean that so when it rains the water basically gushes out of her eaves on a regular basis um, she's also concerned of it uprooting um, it actually about a year ago I had two 100 foot trees uprooted in my property because of that major storm last year and since then she's been quite worried about this tree and she's just being proactive about the situation and just the um, the proximity to her house it's actually the branches are right over her uh, bedroom and and when it when there's heavy winds she actually hears them flapping on her bedroom and keeps her up most of the night um i know this type because the spruce tree it can't be um heavily pruned because of the uh the type of tree it is i, I, I believe it'll be detrimental to the tree they tried pruning it to the side but now it's off balance because uh, the way you know it um it grows and um, she's also concerned about the damage it could cause to the roof. She replaced it a couple of years ago. And um, she's actually here with me right now. Uh, she wants to see if she wants to say anything. Mother, did you want to say anything? No, that the table bothered me too much. You know, the light, I can't sleep by the, the, the roof. I very door outside, I can go on the front. The, the, the cover of the sun, I can stand the veranda. I'm very, very upset with that <laughs> she, she's get, She just gets nervous that she thinks there's a potential they could possibly fall in the house. And just, you know, it's, it's, it's quite close to her home. My late father planted it in approximately 1980. It was a very, very small tree. Never, never expected to get this large. And, uh, and she would replace it, actually. She's willing to replace it with maybe a much smaller tree. If that's a possibility, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions of the speaker? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Crisanti. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, Eleanor. How are you today? Good, good. Thank you. How are you? I, I'm good. So, um, and your mom may know me. Obviously, I'm, I'm your city councillor. I know your street really well. I've been to your mom's house. Uh, I'm sure. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, a, a number of times. So, um, and uh, so I, I'm not aware for, for the last little while, I've sort of been uh, a little tied up. I, uh, I lost my mom and just a couple of weeks ago. So I haven't had a lot of time to, uh, uh, you know, digest some of this or even to come around and see you. Uh, so what yeah. I would like to do, and I think it's, uh, uh, you know, reasonable, I would like to defer this so I have a chance to speak to staff and a chance to come out and see you personally so I can speak to your mom, have a look at the situation oh. and see how I can help. Is that I appreciate reasonable? that. All right? Because yeah. I, so, yes. so Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm gonna move a motion to defer to next day and, um, and we'll, I'll take it from there. Thank you. Uh, any other questions of the speaker? Seeing none. Uh, Ms. Jacka, thank you uh, to you and your mom for joining us. Thank you for uh, calling. We'll, uh, we'll take this into committee now. Any questions? Would they be contacting her? Sorry, would they be contacting her? Uh, so what I'll do is, uh, if, um, if you could contact my office with a quick email, I would appreciate that. 
or I'll get one of my staff to uh, look up your number and give you a call, uh, Eleanor, okay? Will that work? And then we'll set up a meeting. And you're sorry, and your name is Michael? No, no, Crisanti. Crisanti? Vince Crisanti. Vince Crisanti. Oh, yeah, my mother said she knows that name. Okay. Of course. I know she does. Okay, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thank Thanks, you, Eleanor. Right. Yeah, Thank you. If, you, if you can care. help Thank your you. mom uh, get in touch with the counselor, that'd be great. Uh, are there any questions of staff? Seeing Thank none, you. Councillor no. Crisanti, you're going to move to defer to next day. I am. Councillor Crisanti moves deferral. All those in favor? Any opposed? That item is carried. All right, we're just going to move back to EY 5.2. Uh, that motion from Councillor Morley is ready. If the clerks can present that at your leisure. So Councillor Morley moves a modified um, alternate recommendation that's up on the screen. All those in favor? Any opposed, that item is carried. Okay, EY 5.5, 5 Verona Avenue, application to remove two city trees. Uh, we do have a speaker by video, uh, Bruno Lopez. Mr. Lopez, are you available by video? Ah, okay. Welcome in person. <laughs> Okay, uh, can can we just get your name to the clerks? But you're here to speak on this item. Is Igor Igor Fox here to take? Okay. Go guys here. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Welcome to the Etobicoke York Community Council. You've got five minutes to address the council. Please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Um, so we have this application, which is we are removing existing house, splitting the lot and providing two three-story single fa family dwellings. We got uh, committee approval on this one already, committee for adjustments, and we have two trees to be removed. The city staff is recommending us to maintain those trees, but we can't maintain them to go on with the project. We have Arbor's report, which states that both trees are in poor condition. So it appears that the trees uh, will be gone in the new feature, even if removed then today or not. And also they're close to hydro lines, so there's a concern on that as well. And, and that's basically it. Uh, we're proposing, according to the Arborist Report Replantation Plan, so to replace uh, those two trees uh, with six trees at least, or whatever the, the council decides that will be feasible. And that's basically it. Thank you. Any questions of the speaker? So are you, are you the owner? No, uh, I mean behalf of the owner here. I work with Bruno. Oh, you work with Bruno. So yes. you, went, you went to the committee because I, uh, nobody's contacted me on this um, as the local counselor. I haven't even been informed. So you went to the Committee of Adjustment and you got approval to sever the property into, yes. into what? And How two, many lots? Two. Two, two, two lots. Two lots. Yes. And that was conditional um, that you get uh, permission to remove the trees. Yes, we need the first three uh, and all the other approvals as well. Okay, that's it for the uh, uh, up. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah. Any other questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you for joining us. Are there any other speakers on this item? I'll do a double check. There are not. Uh, thank you, sir. You can you can have a seat. Okay. Uh, questions of staff. Yeah, questions of Councilor staff. Councilor Nunziata. Okay, so Max, so this, uh, uh, I, I guess it's very frustrating when uh, applicants go to the Committee of Adjustment and get approval uh, for severance and then they, uh, then they come to us to remove the tree. I mean, that happens all the time. Um, so if you can just give us uh, on, on these three trees um, that the applicant wants to remove. Yeah, the applicant did this, submit a request to Committee of Adjustment to sever the lot and build two new dwellings. They come the request to the, to the staff. The staff attended the site, reviewed, see the conflict of the trees, advised that Urban Forestry will not support removal of the city trees. We're losing the benefits of the trees. So we're losing planting space. Then they sent a memorandum to the Committee of Adjustment, to public hearing to the Committee of Adjustment. So Committee of Adjustment did review the drawings 
our memorandum for sure and others, <coughs> then, then they make a decision to approve the consent to sever the lot and build the two new dwellings. Condition to apply for trees to injure or remove. The applicant then come back to forestry, apply for the permit. Since we told that in the memorandum that we're denying the request, we prepare the letter sent to the applicant and give them an option that you do not agree with our decision, you have an option to appeal. We went through bylaw administrative review with our senior management to see that how we can deal in this situation now since the project is approved already by the Committee of Adjustment and the decision was to deny the removal of the trees and, is, and let the staff report in front of Committee Council to make a final decision. Okay, thank you. Maybe I could uh, ask planning, uh, are they able to um, um, proceed with their application uh, without removing the trees? Through the speaker, I'm not overly familiar with this case. I did look it up. My recall from reading the planning report last week was that we did recommend refusal of this matter. I'm just looking it up here. When oh, it so went the to the planning uh, recommended refusal of the Committee of Adjustment application? Yes. Yeah? Yes, we did, actually. Oh, but okay. the committee approved it. Oh. That's okay. all. I, I don't know a lot of detail. Oh, OK. I, I, I wasn't aware of that. OK. <coughs> that we actually recommended refusal of the severance. OK. Thank you. No. Uh, sorry, Max, to get you back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to staff, um, uh, Max, I'm hoping if you can just speak to us about the uh, condition of the trees. The deputant before us mentioned that they have an arborist report indicating the trees are in poor health. Can you advise what the forestry's finding was with respect to the health of the trees? Yes, through you, Mr. Chair. The trees are in poor condition. Staff confirmed that, but still they are maintainable. And since there are city assets, forestry operation, urban forestry, is maintaining those trees for years and trying to keep as long as they can. Okay. It's a little bit kind of different policy compared to the private trees. So mm -hmm. the private trees are poor condition, are in their property, and it's, uh, you know, the liability issues and stuff like mm -hmm. that, that the bylaw allows or authorizes urban forestry to issue the permit. Right. But for the city trees, since the city urban forestry forestry operation is taking care for the trees, mm -hmm. that's what their decision. Okay. And for this file, forestry operation have inspected the trees and confirmed trees are still maintainable and want to keep some time as, as long as they can. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. Um, any other questions of staff? No. Nope. Uh, to speak, Councillor Nunziak. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't aware of that. The applicant um, didn't even contact my office, and it wasn't until I heard from planning that the planning staff actually um, put a notice in to refuse the, the application, so I'm going to move deferral. Anyone else to speak? Councillor Nunziata moves deferral. All those in favor? Any opposed? That deferral carries. Deferral to the next meeting. Yeah. Yes. Okay. EY 5.6, 92 North Drive, application to remove three city trees. Uh, we have a speaker. Uh, this is registered as electronic. Uh, Laura Watson, is Laura available by video? Good morning, Laura. I didn't hear your sound. Y you uh -huh. appear to be uh, much better. Um, I'm Stephen Holliday, Chair of the Community Council. Welcome to the Etobicoke York Community Council. Uh, you have morning, five minutes to speak to us. Please begin when you're ready. Okay, um, we've been working on this uh, project for quite a few years now and wanted to just give you a bit of background on it. I'll try to be as quick as I can. Um, this is a new residence proposed for a single family. Um, the owner has purchased this property in hopes of building a new home for him and his young family. Um, unlike the property next door, which was purchased by a developer, unlawfully cleared of trees by the developer uh, and uh, an uh, approval to sever the lot into two and develop two new um, properties was approved for the lot next door. My client doesn't wish to do that. They wish to maintain the trees, as many of them as possible on the property to provide 
a beautiful environment for their family to grow up. Um, on this site, we inventoried 129 trees uh, on the site, on the boulevard, and within six meters of the property or 12 meters of the ravine um, limit of disturbance. Of all of those 129 trees, only three city trees are recommended to be removed due to the proposed uh, new driveway, uh, and only nine privately owned trees are proposed to be removed. That quite a, a very small amount of trees to accommodate a new driveway that, or a new, a new development that is on a very well treed lot. Um, the development or the proposal at hand is to build a new uh, hammerhead or U shaped driveway. So one new entrance would be required. Um, the forestry report indicates that these trees are healthy and maintainable. Um, when I did the inventory, um, it was evident that these trees were not in the best condition, although I did inventory them as being in fair and poor conditions, respectively, for the three trees. Um, there's evident branch dieback of these trees. The top has died back of one spruce tree. So if you uh, take that into consideration of a spruce tree, that's a pretty significant uh, a significant uh, indicator of the tree's condition. Um, they do not have good crown vigor as noted in the forestry report. The growth rates were quite poor. Um, the progression of the crown thinning is evident and the chlorosis or yellowing of um, the foliage of the trees is evident as well. And there's many causes for chlorosis on a tree. The forestry report notes that they can be, these trees can become chlorotic when they're stressed. I agree. Um, they also can become um, chlorotic if they've had root damage or if they're impacted by fungal infections or if they've been put uh, or if too much fertilizer has been put down. There's very many, um, uh, very many reasons why chlorosis can happen. Um, I did also uh, send to Max uh, a progression of Google Street View uh, shots of these trees and showed the de declination of the crown integrity of these trees. They just got thinner and thinner and thinner over the few years that were noted on Google Street View. Um, my inclination is to think that these trees were impacted by uh, construction of a new hydro pole that was, or a light standard, I'm not quite sure if it was hydro or light standard, that is uh, installed right around these trees. Um, so uh, in the, to move forward with the, um, comments in the report. Um, forestry noted that these trees improve the quality of life and well-being of the residents on the street. Um, another thing that would improve um, the well-being uh, of the residents on the street is the second driveway, which would allow for a safe access into and out of the driveway. Um, people go very fast on North Drive. I've been there quite a few times now. And backing out of that driveway is becoming more and more of a sport. Um, Max also spoke, or the forestry report also spoke to the loss of planting area. We did in fact prepare a, a planting plan as requested by forestry and submitted for the bylaw administrative review uh, to show the fact that we could replace three trees, three spruce trees, which I might add are not trees that are normally chosen to be planted on city boulevards due to their um, intolerance to street conditions, salt, uh, alkaline soil conditions. Um, but our planting plan in showed that we could plant three large growing native deciduous shade trees on the site within the area or surrounding the new driveway entrance. Um, I, I can't deny the fact that there is loss of planting area, but the fact that this frontage is so large uh, and we can replace the trees one for one on this boulevard with more appropriate species, I think should speak uh, to that uh, comment. Um, and lastly, transportation seemed to be in favor of the fact that this driveway was appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to uh, ask you a couple of questions. Take. So I'm gonna pass the chair to Councillor Nunziata. Councillor Holliday, question. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for coming today, Laura, uh, by, by video. Can you just tell me what exactly what your involvement is in the project? Are you, are you representing a client? And what's your uh, Yes, I'm what's sorry, your I probably should have 
I should have mentioned that at the beginning. I'm, my name is Laura Watson. I'm a consulting arborist and I own Seven Oaks Tree Care and Urban Forestry Consultants. I am the agent acting on behalf of the homeowner. On this file? With regards here. to forestry. On this application? Yes, on this file. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I did look up uh, anything I could find on this and the information I had was a numbered company. Are you able to share the name of your client? And it's okay if you're not. I just, is that something that can be shared with us? I'm not quite sure at this time. Okay. Um, and your your purpose today is to speak to the application of the tree removal. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, from your opinion, um, are you able to agree or disagree that these trees are healthy and maintainable, as would be described in the city's bylaw? Well, I, I disagree that they're healthy. I feel that there has been uh, an evident progression of d declination of the tree's conditions um, based on the Google Street View study that was submitted to Max. There was evidence of the, the crowns thinning, branches dying back at the top. When you see the dieback of the leader, the central leader of a uh, coniferous tree that is quite... Uh, quite a notable um, indicator that these trees may be in a state of decline. Yes, it may be that it was pruned back, but we don't know if it was or not. So I have to just base my assessment on what I see um, and what I can observe. I And I observe that these trees are thinning, they're chlorotic, there was construction, I'm not sure how recent ago that construction was for that light standard, um, that may have impacted that these trees. But I feel like they are in a slow state of decline. Have you been on a site inspection of the trees yourself? I did the inventory. Because um, you mentioned the uh, Google Street View study. I didn't quite understand what yes. that meant. Is that um, While we were in conversations with forestry, I uh, provided to Max a uh, uh, seven pages of screenshots from Google Street View showing progressions from 20, 2007 to 2021, I showing see. the trees and sort of how they progressed over time. Okay, so and I can show that here today if you like. So you can you tell me that you've been on site in order to provide me your qualified opinion of the the condition of the trees? I have been on site. Yes. Okay, so you mentioned they weren't healthy. Where are they maintainable? Anything is maintainable. It's just a, a matter of how long are you going to, how long is forestry going to be willing to maintain them if they are city owned trees? In the report, it was noted that uh, they are healthy and maintainable. Uh, I, I believe they can be maintained as long as somebody comes back and removes the deadwood. And uh, it was noted that um, mulching and watering. So if forestry would be willing to head out and provide mulch and water perhaps an investigation into the soil health to determine the cause of the chlorosis, um, determine if there's any phytophthora or canker or fungal infection on these roots that was caused by the impact um, or the root cutting or the compaction completed or that was caused by the construction of that new light standard. Okay, thank you very so, much. Yes, I believe they're maintainable, but I think that it is a, a slow, process that will be just drawn out for these trees. Thank you very much. Um, you're Thank welcome. you. Are, are there any further questions? No? Okay, questions to staff. Councillor Holliday. <coughs> Mr. Dita, uh, thank yes. you for joining us. Um, what was urban forestry's opinion of these trees, uh, their condition? with respect to the bylaw? Yeah, the opinion of urban forestry staff was that trees are healthy and maintainable. Again, through you, Ms. Chair, is that in this situation or other situation, when we get an application, the arborist does their inspection, does their assessment. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we call the trees fair condition, even by the arborist, we've been talking back and forth, that is within the health condition of the trees. The bylaw has only three categories, exception, poor condition and healthy trees. So fair, good, excellent are still healthy. Anyway, the, 
if I may, in this situation is that the application to remove the trees is because of the construction. So now trying to find a way if the trees are maintainable or not. Yes, the trees are maintainable. Do they need to take, do the staff need to take care for a separation? Absolutely, yes. Like for all other trees on, on, on the city road other ones. But the trees are maintainable and we're losing the planting space and the trees benefits. So at the heart of this application, there is, um, I guess, a U-shaped driveway and a new entrance because of the U-shaped driveway. There's only a single entrance driveway today. Are the trees in question in direct conflict with the U-shaped, the new U-shaped driveway entrance? Yes, there are in conflict. So in order to- It's a to, great change too. Okay, so in order to build it the way that uh, they've described it, it has to be, those trees have to come out. Yeah, if they build the driveway as it planned, the trees has to go. Is there an opportunity to modify the plan for the driveway and still sh save a U-shaped function? Not for the new shape. They can keep a driveway as is, as many, many kind of houses are in that street. But if they do the U-shape, the trees have to go. They okay. have to change the grade, the stuff. Okay. And then the, the bylaw is plain for you. Uh, if the trees are healthy and maintainable, forestry refuses. Yeah. yeah, we're trying to do that because we lose the benefits of the trees. And at the same time, when they do the U-shape and grade change, they have to put the asphalt, they have to put there, so the planting space is gone too. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dita. May I yeah. just ask a couple of questions of planning? Um, there were no objections. This was a committee of adjustment item. There were no objections with respect to the complete plan. Is that correct? Best as we can tell. Through you, uh, to you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I did look into this matter. Uh, this, we did report, planning did report to the committee of adjustment. There were a number of variances for this proposal, the variance that directly relates to this issue is the bylaw does allow for uh, two exits or entrances provided a lots greater than 18 meters and they can meet the landscaping requirements. The variance in this case related to the proposal wasn't quite meeting the landscape requirements. It wasn't about the two, the exit and, and, and entrance and exit. I guess the best way to frame it, the report, our report is is silent on the matter of, okay. of, of the two driveways. It's, we did ask the committee to put in a number of conditions with its approval, but none related to this specific issue. Okay. Um, so there wasn't necessarily uh, an objection in the report from staff with respect to this particular issue? That's correct, sir. Okay. If I've got time, I'm going to ask one more question of transportation, actually. Yep. Uh, who do we have online? This may be a question for uh, right-of-way permitting. Um, Marco Savino, I'm here for right-of-way permitting to the chair. Uh, Mr. Savino, I, I, I noticed uh, that this particular site has a lot of grade changes and some retaining walls. I'm not quite sure whether they're city owned or private retaining walls, but I just wondered if you could tell me, is there an application before you for a permit to do work on the city's right of way? I have not received any, through the chair, I have not received any through my, my team. Um, I believe Nick, Luigi Licalucci, who is also on the online, um, may be able to speak to a little bit of that. Um, however, we, we do have some, I don't want to say issues, but we do notice that there are some encroachments that should be dealt with uh, okay. through this process. And on my last couple of seconds, I'll ask if Mr. Nicolucci has any comments as well, because I just, I'm just trying to get out some complexity about the application that isn't necessarily shown in the, um, the, the forestry report, if there's any comment that you can provide. Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, um, with respect to the encroachments, um, <clears throat> we did notice those encroachments through the Committee of Adjustment application that was, uh, uh, that was received by our unit. Um, we did provide comments on the Committee of Adjustment application in terms of the driveway. We accepted the driveway. In terms of the encroachments, we were sort of silent on it because the encroachment process and approval for those encroachments would, is dealt with outside of the Committee of Adjustment process. It's dealt with through the permitting process. And, and quite frankly, the Committee of Adjustment, uh, if those encroachments in the public right-of-way 
the Committee of Adjustment has no jurisdiction on uh, dealing with those encroachments. Those are those encroachments would fall under Chapter 743 of the Municipal Code, and there is a separate process to approve those encroachments. Thank you. Are there any further questions to staff? No? Okay, to speak, Councillor Holliday. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Nunziata. I, I'm going to ask that this item be deferred to next meeting. Uh, and I'm going to ask, if it's not in the motion, just verbally, that the applicants speak to transportation services, specifically the people that do the permits for the right-of-way work. Um, and I'll just make the simple observation that uh, some of the steps are out of sequence here. Um, there's a call for a new driveway entrance, and there's some retaining walls and grade changes, and I think those need to be sorted out first. Um, so that's, uh, I'll ask for your support on that. Okay, on the motion by Councillor Holliday to defer to the next meeting? Okay, on favor, carry. Thank you. Pass the chair. Thank you. Okay. EY 5.9, compulsory stop control, the Elms at Vista Humber. Councillor Cassandi, we just held that down. At uh, 5.9, you said uh, we, we looked at that. That is not uh, in my ward. I think it's... Uh, um, uh, when you look at it, it's, I'm not sure whose ward it is. Uh, it says here ward one, that's an error. Uh, so what we'll do if we'll, we'll get that checked out. We'll hold that. Yeah. We'll continue to hold that. And we'll figure that one out. Yep. It's not yours. It would be ward two. Uh, mm, no, we'll, we'll get it sorted out in a couple of minutes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Otherwise, it doesn't sound contentious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Get the stop sign in the right uh, in the right word. Um, it, it happens. Okay, EY 5.10 Wood Stream Drive parking amendments and heavy truck prohibition. Councilor Grisanti, uh, we held this as well for you. Yes, th um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So, uh, given that um, we consulted with the uh, community on this particular issue, uh, we got some. Uh, good feedback from the community, but I have not had the opportunity to review it with staff. So I'm going to defer this to next day to have that opportunity and then take it up at the next meeting. Okay. Councillor Crisanti, I'll, I'll just, any other members wishing to speak? Nope. Uh, Councillor Crisanti moves deferral to next day. All those in favor? Any opposed? And that item is carried. Uh, EY 5.14, snowplow damage to sod along sidewalks and other landscape features within the road right of way. I held it on behalf of Councillor Crisanti. You may have questions, Councillor Nunziata. You had questions. This is the, uh, the item on snowplow damage. Did you have questions? Councillor Crisanti. Mike is on. Okay. So, yeah, just give me a sec here. I just want to refer to that chart. Here it is. So, the questions would like to go to um, hi, Vince. How are you? Good. Okay. Um, so, we, we have a, a report, and quite frankly, in all the years, I, I've been around, around here for about 12 years in total. And, I don't remember seeing a chart that actually defines it and breaks it down in the way you did. It may have been there, but so um, my my first impression was, uh, and, and and given the particular year that we had with the amount of snow, that uh, um, almost fell off my chair with the total number of complaints. We did get quite a few up in our area uh, that you might be aware of uh, uh, events as well, as it says here, 174. War two got hit the hardest, and then War three comes in third. So um, this is uh, in, in, uh, one issue that it, it doesn't feel good to come in first, uh, you know, uh, with only 174, but even that is quite a bit. So I'm wondering, Vince, if, um, and I, I've, read, I've read your report here, and, and I know you have a new contractor. What steps would be taken now to try and mediate and, and to try and um, certainly do better in the next round? Um, through the chair, so we've actually started beginning our conversations with the winter contractors, um, 
And one of the items we have on our list, on our work plan, includes improved service when it comes to sidewalk winter clearance. Uh, we recognize that the last winter season, there were some issues that all contractors had dealt with, specifically the um, availability of equipment, the delivery schedules of equipment, and staffing. And these are all post-pandemic consequences that are globally wide being seen. So in some cases, the contractors were unable to do what we call walkovers, where you have the contractor walk through the beats with the operators to become familiar with the area, specifically on sidewalks, boulevards, encroach pits, and so forth. So that's one item that we are scheduling with the contractor that in early fall, they will be required to do walkovers on all of the beats with their operators. We're hoping that they won't have the same staffing and labor issues. They now have all the equipment in place, which is good. Um, so that's one of the things that we are working with our contractor is improved training, improved uh, familiarity with the area, and uh, just improved uh, operations of the equipment because some of the equipment was relatively new for the operators. And so those are some of the items that we begun having our conversations and will continue th throughout the summer. The highest, um, yeah, and thank you for that answer. I mean, it, it, you, you, it makes a lot of sense that you would have that type of training in advance. And so that wasn't possible? In the yes, um, we actually saw that citywide and not just for sidewalks. So many of the contractors, all the contractors had experienced problems with the equipment manufacturers. Uh, there were in some cases orders as early as 18 months that were still being processed by the, by the manufacturers of the equipment. So in some cases, equipment was being delivered literally late October, November, and December. And those are conditions outside of their control. In fact, we at the city also experienced that same issue because we also, uh, service sidewalks in the downtown midtown area that issue should no longer be present for the next winter season and then the other issue is staffing labor uh, which we hope as well with the additional training we'll, we won't see the same issues that we saw the last winter season yeah. Um, yeah, i hope that's the case i, I yeah. i've yet to see a season where we don't have damage uh you know of some sort but but to this uh to this extent um you know this is quite con uh, considerable could you tell me the difference between it says your boulevard plow damage mm -hmm. that can you describe that is that the sidewalk damage you're referring to yes well there are three or service request codes uh the main one is in reference to damage to the boulevard abutting the sidewalk either on the side of the home or uh, the boulevard abutting the street. Right. That is 90, 95% of all the service requests. We have two other service request codes. One is damage to the curbside. So that could be either um, a catch basin or the curb itself or damage to the road. And those are not necessarily associated with sidewalk machines. Yeah. So the sidewalk SR is the one with respect to boulevard. I'm ran out of time, but just finally, who pays for this? Do you, do you uh, charge it back to the contractor? There is no cost to the city. All costs are borne by the contractor for all repairs and maintenance as a result of winter damage on boulevards. So it's to their benefit to do better? Much so. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Grassani, if you have more questions, we can come back for sure. Sure, thank um, you. Councilor Nunziata, let's go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Okay, going back to the cost, um, so you're saying there's no cost to the taxpayers. Um, the um, contractor pays for it. So do we know what the total cost is for the repairs? And do we have to get after the contractors to do the work? Um, so what if, what if they don't go out and do the work? Well, like, right. Okay, so we get calls from constituents saying, I'm waiting and waiting. The repairs haven't been done. So we have to get uh, after the contractor. and. So the contractor could just say, well, sorry, you know, we're busy or whatever. And then do we have to then sue the contractor if this work isn't done? So all of the locations have been identified and provided to the contractor. They were all provided in April. 
So each one of those locations, the 1,500 that you see in the report, have all been submitted to the contractors for repairs and the maintenance. And they have been instructed to complete the repairs by uh, late spring, early summer. So we're looking at the maintenance all being completed by late June, early, early July. Um, that's as a result of the availability of sod. So right now, many of the sod farmers are now starting to provide sod. So it's a question of supply. But where there were issues of just seeding or repairs to curbstones, all those, or to driveways, all that work is happening now. I have staff that oversee the contracts. And as part of their responsibility is to be in contact with the contractor to ensure that they do in fact do the repairs as required. I do have in every agreement a liquidated damage that if the contractor should not repair within the timeline, then they are subject to additional financial penalties. And the completion date for all these repairs is, uh, are you saying in the Early spring, late summer, correct. Okay, so we're almost summer now. So um, then why can't we as counselors then get notifica notification? Because what's happening, I, I don't know if other counselors have the same issue, the residents that have contacted us during the snowfall we're saying, oh, we're going to come back and repair. And they keep calling us to say, when are they going to come back? Like, is there any way we can get that information or communications so we can respond to the constituents that have contacted our office? This is when it's going to start, complete it. Because right now we're saying, well, yeah, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. Um, and it's frustrating not only for the constituent, but as well as for the counselors, because we don't really have an answer mm -hmm. uh, on when this work is going to be done. So we also share the frustration. Um, it depends on the nature of the repair. So as I indicated, if it's a complete sod replacement, then the contractor is in uh, contract with their sod supplier. And based on our conversations with sod farms and with the contractor, sod is only now starting to be provided to the contractors. So we were unable to do sod replacements as early as late April until now. No, so I'm now it's starting to get those. No, I understand. Yeah. When is that information going to be communicated to the counselors so we can get back so, to the So, yes, yeah, certainly. We can certainly try to provide you a, yeah. schedule, a schedule of when the contractor will be in an area, and hopefully that will give you some information that you can pass on to the council, I'm sorry, to the resident. So, yeah, I'm more than happy to try to put together some type of schedule or table. Right that would at least give you an indication of when the contractor will be in that neighborhood making repairs. Yeah, I think that would help uh, a lot. I know Certainly. it would help with me. Um, so as far as the, the, the sidewalk, uh, snow removal, um, with this equipment that we bought, the new equipment in that, mm -hmm. this damage isn't done by that, the new equipment. Some of it was. Some, Some of it what? is done by in-house staff and contractors. So it didn't help with us getting new equipment. It's not a question of the equipment. The equipment it's, it's, is, is, spec is specified to be compliant with the width of the sidewalks. So this is not a question of whether wrong equipment was purchased or not. No. This is a question, as I indicated in the report, to multiple factors on why there might be property damage as a result of winter operations. Winter, weather, the ground temperatures, uh, that they're done at night when there's no lights and encroachments, illegal encroachments. There's a whole host of issues. Now, that's not rationalizing. It's just trying to explain why there might be some property damage. But this is not a case of oversized equipment. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Councilor Morley? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to staff. Um, thank you for this report. Uh, in terms of the numbers of uh, concerns or complaints that we're looking at here in the report, were those all specifically uh, reported in from residents or were some of these caught by staff who were out inspecting the areas? I would say the vast majority of them were through 311 service requests, but there are a portion where I have my staff patrolling the roads. So for instance, we do clear mechanically sidewalks 
in areas where there isn't residential neighborhoods, right. industrial, commercial areas. And in those cases, I ask my staff that they patrol those areas looking for property damage. So yes, we do clear 7,400 kilometers of sidewalks in all, all neighborhoods, whether they be residential, commercial, industrial. So it requires a combination of both reactive and proactive uh, identification. That's very helpful, thank you. And I will note um, in Ward 3, we do have quite a significant number of industrial areas and a, a quite significant number of employment lands, uh, recognizing that without having homeowners there directly mm -hmm. or maybe even you know folks walking regularly, um, there's some significant damage that may have gone uncaptured. So uh, my team and I did go out to be Thank proactive you. and document and, and to put that in, but I just wanted to ensure that there is in fact a mechanism yep. uh, in-house where we are also putting eyes on the street, in the, especially in the areas where we know uh, it's not likely to be reported in for us to address. Uh, my second question is with respect to um, Sort of the timelines for for the um, sorry early morning morning timelines for the uh, improvement. So mm -hmm. shortly after the damage, the sod is sort of sitting in clumps. At which point it seems that if it's captured within a in that window within the first week or two of the damage happening or the the um, ground melting that the sod might be able to be re replaced uh, as opposed to having brand new sh sod chipped in, this kind of thing. Um, so I'm just curious about the process for remediation mm -hmm. and if there's any opportunity for improvement or for additional steps earlier on. Sure. Um, so where we're not, and again, this is more of a probably benefit to the contractor sure. who might save some dollars if they're um, getting on it a little bit earlier. Can you talk to us about what opportunities exist in terms of proactive remediation? Certainly. So in cases where damage was uh, done perhaps in January, February, and significant where you have large mounds of broken sod or even curbstones or whatnot, um, it is incumbent upon the contractor to remove those, uh, those potential safety uh, hazards mm -hmm. and to, at the very least, try to uh, perhaps deal with the grade. You, we wouldn't do any replacing or of sod or seeding until after May. Uh, the weather conditions just are not uh, subject to having that catch, so to speak. So, but having said that, it is incumbent upon the contractor to make the area safe. I'd have to say that due to some of the staffing issues I had to deal with in terms of maintenance patrollers, mm -hmm. um, at times we were running 20% down in terms of vacancies. Um, we were somewhat um, not as comprehensive, but moving forward, that's an area that from my perspective, we need to improve. Um, our maintenance patrollers, our investigators, um, have to be a bit more thorough in terms of identifying those areas and, and reporting them so that the contractor can be made aware and dealt with those to make it safe. So I acknowledge the counselor's um, helpful, constructive comments on those, and that's something that I'm also looking at. And I've also say, with respect to your previous comments, if you have any addresses in industrial lands, please forward them to my office and we'll be happy to bring those to the contractor's attention. Thank you, we have and we will continue to do so. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Additional okay. questions? Yes, uh, just, a, just a couple. So, so there, there are some damage, for example, uh, Vince. Um, uh, I, I know of one uh, actually near my house where, where the uh, sort of the machine went over the curb. There's no sidewalk. It, can, it, it sort of ripped the grass, piled it up, expose the soil. So what's happening now is the grass is growing in and it looks like a little hill, all right? So that, that's something that would never be captured or never be repaired. No, uh, under the contract, it's not just a question of replacing sod or seeding, it's actually addressing the grade issues. So if there's a grade uh, elevation issue as a result of what happened, the contractor will be responsible for making those repairs as well. Well, it, it kind of, the machine, I guess, ripped the soil, went, went over the curb, ripped the, 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 the earth, the grass, kind of piled it up in a little pile, right? And now what's happening is the grass is just kind of like growing in and it just, I, I don't think that'll ever get fixed. I'm not sure that anybody will ever 
I, I imagine there's a few of those. The, the, the question I did want to ask is this. Uh, at what point do, do these, um, um, because I, I share some of the frustration that, uh, that um, Councillor Nanziata and others have raised. At some point, some of these things get bounced to the insurance because the contractor says, no, nah, it's not my fault. Uh, the, you guys say it's, it's, it's not our fault. Uh, and, uh, and then they become sort of, I, I guess the contract, let, let me ask this question. So the contractor is, is asked to carry insurance, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, so um, when, for example, they, um, they dispute um, damage or, or damages the kind of damage that they say, well, whatever. At what point does it, does it, uh, does it, um, um, is, is, is an insurance claim made? So, uh, both for the, us and for them. Through the chair, um, there is a claims process that a resident could also um, access, and that's where Insurance and Risk Management Division will then um, take care of that particular file. And in that case, uh, that's where um, there's a determination if, in fact, insurance is provided or not. That's something that Transportation Services does not have any involvement with. We strongly recommend that any resident pursue the 311 service request um, approach. It is rare that the contractor will dispute um, a identification of property damage. When we can determine that damage as a result of a winter operation servicing, the contractor has rarely, rarely disputed that. Okay. Um, now they carry insurance for a whole host of reasons. One of them is property damage, but that's as a result of them having to then bear all the costs. But I can say that historically, and I can confidently say that the contractors have rarely disputed a case where we have provided the evidence to indicate that the damage is a result of the winter services operations. But, but you do have some disputes, right? Like where, where they say, okay, it's not us. Then what happens? What happens when, when you disagree with them? There's a dispute resolution process within the agreement that we follow uh, to deal with those type of issues that would involve ultimately going to mediation or an arbitrator if necessary. Okay, in terms of your, your like, so w w when in your contract, there's a holdback, right? Like you, you, you don't pay out the contract in its entirety uh, the day that the, the guy finishes the work, right? If, w when the contract, w the, when does the, the winter maintenance, the, the, the winter snow removal contract end with the contractors? Uh, it is a seven year contract, which began this last winter season, 2022 to 2030, with three additional option years. No, no I understand, but their work, when does it, when does it end? Like, their their work, work officially ends April, I believe it's April 7th, April 8th, in that area, in terms of us activating equipment. Okay. However, the maintenance of property damage continues okay. after April. Right. So, but you, you, so you don't pay them. Uh, you, you don't. You don't pay them fully. But April seventh, we pay up until the term, which is like I said, around April seventh. Okay, you pay the term, and there's is there a holdback? Is do you do you hang on to some money until they finish all this um, maintenance work or no? Well, the maintenance work, as I said, there is no cost to the city, so the invoice does not include any property damage repairs. Um, if, in fact, there is a ongoing issue, then that's where we would issue a liquidated damage, and then that would be applied to the next invoice, which can continue to the next winter season in November, December, and so forth. So it's not like, um, it's not like a construction contract where there's a holdback. You just, your invoice, you pay. We apply liquidated damage holds on invoices. So when we do issue liquidated damage, then that is applied to an invoice, and then the total is reduced accordingly. And then when okay, is that okay. paid? When sorry, last one, and then we'll, yeah. We'll do and, the, and, and 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 then when when is that paid? Is that paid when the when they've um, when they've um, repaired the damage? When when you're satisfied that they've done the work to repair the damage, then you pay them out. So as I indicated, because there is no cost borne to the city, 
their monthly invoice will have no reference to property damage. Only if I issue a liquidated damage following the repairs, then that liquidated damage gets, gets submitted to the next invoice. And then we just reduce the total amount by that liquidated damage. It's not necessarily a holdback. It's a reduction of what they charge the city. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to check with my colleagues. Uh, any more questions? We can do a second round. I know this is important. Councilor Crisanti, did you have any other questions? Okay, Councilor Nunziata. Yeah, just just one last mm -hmm. question on the comment you just made. So, does the city, though, with all the complaints that come in, monitors that the work has been done? You yes. Don't, yeah. Yes. So, so you go through each complaint mm -hmm. and to monitor that it is actually has been done. Right. You, you, it's the responsibility of the contractor to provide us with evidence that the work has been completed. And okay. that gets submitted to our staff to review. So you get a list of all the damage. Correct. And when they've been yes. Completed. Well, we provide the list. We yeah. provide the list. And then they then follow that up with a subsequent um, update for each one of those locations. Okay, thanks. Councilor Peruzza, did you have any more? Just one last question. Um, do you have any sense of the cost of just managing the um, the deficiencies or the damages? Like, how many people does that involve? And 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 what's it, it, do you do you have a sense of the cost of that? A just, cost just, of it. It depends just, on just, the nature. Just the administrative, you know, the guy that goes out, looks at it, takes the picture, files it, goes back, fills some paperwork. Uh, follows up, has to go back and take a look at it. No, answer. I wouldn't have a cost to that degree. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Crisanti to speak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I have a, um, I have a motion that uh, was passed on to clerks who put on the screen, and it's, it's really a friendly motion. It's, this motion already speaks to uh, what staff has agreed to do in the report, but I'm hoping through this motion that staff will, will um, uh, communicate very firmly that the outcomes of this winter season uh, report that we just spoke to and we have in front of us is unacceptable. And, and I didn't put this part in writing that it should be, there should be a zero tolerance on providing this type of subpar services. And some of the points that Vince brought up um, that, uh, that it's not a, a cost directly to the taxpayer but it is a cost to every single resident when they're inconvenienced, when they're either blocked in because they can't get out and go to, a, go to work or go to um, a doctor's appointment, particularly for seniors in our city. Uh, it's, a, it's a big cost to the residents. And, and for years and years, we've been discussing this issue. Uh, quite frankly, I don't know that we'll ever get it fixed, but I think if, if we take a, a, a far more aggressive approach and talk about, um, uh, you know, the, the fact that we're just not going to have any more tolerance for this. And, and uh, at, at the uh, Infrastructure and Environment Committee, I may also address this and, and, uh, and uh, recommend a couple of other motions that I'm not going to speak to right now. Um, so we have a whole series and litany of issues uh, that, you know, start with windrow issues, uh, snow piling, blocking sight lines. Uh, people getting blocked in, uh, boulevard damage that does uh, that it seems to never end. Um, and so working towards solution is a key. A couple of things I'd like to throw on the table is, uh, aside from what we're already doing, and I'm sure um, you know staff has, has thought about it, but we, we need to revisit that. Um, educating even um, our, our, our residents in terms of what they can do if they get stuck, if there's a problem. Um, and uh, one other thought that came to mind was they, they have these uh, little flags, and I know part of the issue is identifying where the sidewalks are, but these little thin tiny flags with bright red and orange color that if um, it'll probably cost the city or the contractor a lot less to supply every single residential uh, residence with a handful of these flags, half a dozen roughly, it will likely cover the whole front of the property, and you stick them on the ground so we can identify where these sidewalks are. Um, now, it may not work 100% of the time, but I think uh, it'll work the majority of the time. 
uh, as long as the drivers of the sidewalk plows are trained um, and, and doing that advanced visit just makes sense. You know, here's a new contractor, took on a big job, did not take the time to go out and, uh, and do their homework before they started on, on, a, on a very heavy snow season that we just had. So, um, so I think there are solutions and I'm hoping that uh, we work towards uh, mitigating uh, uh, the issues that we've been uh, talking about for the last 50 years and finally come up to a better way of doing it. On that note, I'll move my motion, and if there's any other speakers. Indeed. You, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I, I also have a short motion. So, yep. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Nunziata to speak. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank staff for the report. <clears throat> I, I do have a motion that the Director of Operations and Maintenance Transportation Services provide a communication on timelines to the members of the Etobicoke York Committee Council that can be shared with the public. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this this year, uh, you know, as Councillor Crescenti mentioned, uh, for some reason I received more complaints than ever. And as far as the damage to, uh, um, to um, you know, boulevards and uh, front lawns, uh, the calls were coming in directly to me. They weren't going to 311. So we have a list of all of them and that they keep emailing us and asking, when is this work going to be done? When is this? And we don't know. Um, but... Um, you know, this year, for for whatever reason, um, you know, the the contractors. I had I had residents that contacted my office that actually, when the snow plow came down the street, after a resident plowed the driveway and the sidewalk, that they came and threw all the snow back into the driveway and back onto the uh, onto the sidewalk, or they removed the snow and then they threw it in somebody uh, somebody's driveway and they couldn't even get out. Uh, so I don't know what happened. Like, I mean, it's, a lot of it is common sense, really. You don't plow snow into someone's driveway. Um, and so there seem to be a lot more complaints uh, this this year. And, and um, you know, I thought that maybe with the new equipment, we wouldn't have that many problems as far as damage to retaining walls and to front, uh, front yards. But um, I, I don't know. But I, I want to thank you for the report. But... I would like to get a, a communications on the ones in, and I'm sure I want in my ward, I'm sure all the councils want it on, that we can pass on to our constituent, especially to the ones that have contacted our office directly because a lot of them didn't go through 311 um, and they came directly to the council's <coughs> office. Uh, so we can communicate that and we can let people know this is when the work is gonna start, be completed, and this way we can uh, manage that rather than have constituents keep e emailing us and saying, when is it going to be done? What's going on? And all. it's summer, nothing's been done. And we get a lot of those complaints. So thank you for the report. Thank you. Councillor Morley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, I have a motion as well. We've all been inspired this morning by the report. And thank you to staff for their great work. Um, my motion reads that the Director of Operations and Maintenance Transportation Services be directed to identify the source of complaints and reports in future communications to councillors. And I just want to thank my colleague, uh, Councillor Nunziata, for her leadership requesting um, the communication schedule and uh, the maintenance or the repair schedule uh, from staff. Uh, as a former staffer myself, I know how exciting the winter season always is and how busy um, the office is with respect to phone calls and as, especially as a new uh, office now and as a new counselor, and my team certainly got, uh, got, got their fill of calls and complaints uh, throughout the course of this past winter season as we all did. Um, so for us, really the critical part is when residents call our office, they expect answers. Uh, and it's really important for us to have those answers for them uh, to be able to manage their expectations accordingly. The other piece uh, for me and uh, the reason for my motion is that uh, as a ward with quite significant coverage of employment lands and, and industrial spaces, I do note um, that 
where complaints come in and where there are eyes on the street, so to speak, uh, we often do uh, get a chance to get those into the queue, to have them addressed. Um, but it's often the areas that are not, um, you know, uh, have neighbors nearby um, that garbage accumulates, that damage goes unaddressed, um, and they be that's how wear and tear kind of happens to our city uh, without people being proactive and eyes on the street. And so I did want to just encourage staff as we continue continue to work through uh, improvement on this issue, um, that their uh, maintenance patrollers are really critical as well uh, in these areas where there are not residents um, being able to report in to us. And I think it's equally as important for us as a city to be right on top of those things, um, being thoughtful, practicing our common sense, um, you know, identifying uh, where that's necessary. And just a small note as an, as an aside, but, you know, the litter, for example, and we're in spring season, spring cleaning season, um, and I've noted a few areas where we've had um, uh, lawn mowers go out and mow over garbage. And like instead of coordinating to ensure that the garbage is cleaned up in advance or taking those extra few moments to remove the trash before, you know, running the the plow over. So, you know, I think in all of these areas, the very minimum people expect uh, in our city is a sense of pride, sense of, sense of cleanliness, and a sense of uh, maintenance. Um, so that extends from our um, our sidewalks, our boulevards, um, and right up to, you know, some of our main areas. So thank you. I hope I'll have your support. Thank you, Councillor. Um, may I just ask you a point of clarification on it? I think it would be helpful. Yep. Um, when you mention the source of the complaint, you're not asking for the resident's name? Not at all. Just literally internal or external. Like, was it something that our staff patrollers found uh, and are reporting in, or is it a coming from the public? Just as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councillor Morley. Uh, Councillor Prutza, is your motion ready? Yes. All right. Councillor Prutza to speak. Yeah. So, so they got the motion, but I'll explain it very briefly. It's, it's really simple. That... So, so we have here basically, uh, the, the, you know, there's 1,521 um, uh, sites where damage has been identified. So somebody actually goes out and takes a picture of these sites, and so someone complains about it, uh, uh, or or and or uh, one of Vincent's staff goes by and t and I, I sees it. Say, oh, there's damage here, or the contractor says. Okay, we did. They admit they say we did some damage there, but um, you know, there's no way to tell that somebody has looked at it and looked at the damage and has said, um, "We're going to. This is something that's on our radar to be fixed, either by the contractor or by the city." So you know, unlike a curb cut, you know, the city goes out and marks it, paints curb cuts, and people say, oh, somebody looked at it, and there's little arrows, and they're going to cut this curb. They know that that work is coming, it's eminent. When? We don't know, but it, so, it's someone's radar. This work, th there's no way to identify uh, what repairs are going to be taking place. So what my motion asks is that the staff develop a marking system so that when the guy goes out to take a picture and says this is damage, that he puts down, uh, you know, Vince, give me the little idea, the little flag that says uh, this is slated to be repaired, or paints a circle on it, you know, like uh, with some orange paint says this is going to be repaired, or, or some other marking system like a little pylon that, that where you, you put it on site and says uh, th this is work that's going to be repaired either by the city or by the contractor, just so that everybody knows that 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 has been identified as some damage and will be fixed or repaired. Uh, in that case, uh, then you don't you also ha don't have a lot of redundancy so that one person complains about it and uh, you don't know if it's if it's on the radar uh, as a as a as a deficiency that needs to be fixed and then someone else will complain about it again. Right? So, for example, I raised an example earlier where uh, near where I live, um, off the curb, a plow kicked up some dirt. Um, I don't believe I complained about it. I don't know if anybody else in the neighborhood has complained about it. Uh, there's no marker that says that it will be repaired. So you don't know if it's on the radar. 
Uh, and if it had, did get on the radar, then that way you also avoid redundancy. Multiple people complaining about the same thing and, and, and then a, a person being sent out to investigate the same, uh, the same issue. So if a marking system could be developed that identifies where these uh, deficiencies or damages have occurred uh, so that people uh, as well as us know uh, that 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 area that that particular um, uh, a problem has been looked at uh, and is in the works uh, that would be useful. So if staff can develop a system to do that, I think it would help all of us, including uh, the public. That's the essence of the of the motion. Okay. Thank you. Um, anyone else to speak? I think we got it covered. If it's okay, I'll pass the chair. Councillor Holliday to speak. Um, I just want, my, my colleagues have placed a bunch of motions, so I won't move one, but I, uh, I just wanted to thank staff for completing the tedious task of preparing this report uh, rather quickly. Um, and I, I brought the, uh, the letter to community council last, last meeting because this is an issue that's really important to all of us because it's really important to the public. Uh, we do a lot of good work at the City of Toronto uh, we moved a lot of snow this winter. Uh, we fix a lot of roads. We maintain a lot of things. And then sometimes when one small thing doesn't go right, um, it tarnishes all of that. And, and that's a shame. Uh, but sometimes that small thing is really important to someone. Uh, and you know, if you look after a lawn or a garden or shovel the snow, you understand uh, when the beautiful sod gets torn up. And then you look at it, you say, oh my gosh, who's going to fix this? And oh boy, I got to go now, I got to get a roll of sod and I have to repair that. And people take pride in, in the space in front of their properties. They help the city maintain them. And that's really what makes this district beautiful um, and what makes people very happy. So when people are upset, councillors are upset, um, I can only imagine what the call takers get at 311 uh, if I can gauge on you know, how upset some of my meetings and conversations with residents have been. So this is a really, really important period that we're going into that, you know, it was the first go around on a, uh, a new winter maintenance contract, new contractors, different circumstances. And I think, you know, people do their best to do a good job. Um, and not everything went perfect, uh, but the snow did get moved and we did make it through the winter storms. But this period is really important that uh, people get it right because all of those bad thoughts about what people experienced would turn from that upside down frown to a smile if the contractors come in and do a good job resodding and they clean things up well and people look at that and say you know what hey this stuff happens I get it being a plow driver is not easy at night it's dark it's covered in snow people make mistakes those blades are really wide and you just make one one little bump with the steering wheel and all of a sudden you're tearing up sod. But if people come back and fix it, and as I said, they do a good job and they let the resident know, please water this. Here's a little piece of paper to remind you. And I think that was in the report. Um, things turn out much better. And uh, I'm just glad about the efforts uh, that have been put forward. There's an interesting idea about the flags and different things there. Although I think our uh, right of way folks might have some thoughts on what's okay and what's not because um, we want to make sure it's safe but but nonetheless uh, very very important issue I'm glad we had a chance to talk about it I hope staff will take uh, these motions as helpful and uh, we will continue to improve the process as the year rolls over and finally the the report is valuable as you can see it's the the largest debate of today and the largest conversation among councillors because I think it reflects what's important to folks that are out there and uh, I thank everyone for their work on that. And I suspect we will talk about it again one other time at a different time. So uh, thank you. Um, thank on. you. Thank you, Councillor Holliday. And I just want to say thank you to staff as well. Oh. We're not dumping on you, but oh. yeah. <laughs> and to thank the contractors. You. Thank you to the contractors for, for getting through a tough winter. And, and, and Mr. Chair, if I, if I could just add uh, my thanks as well, but it's not about uh, dumping as, uh, you know, Councillor Nunziata said, it's just about working together and we're sharing with you what we go through too with our residents and, 
And maybe, Mr. Chair, I can suggest we do them all as a bundle, if that's possible or not. Uh, well, I'll take guidance from the clerk, but I think we just we just passed through the four the four amendments. Right. I'll try to do them in in, in order. Uh, so, if we're ready, on Councillor Crisanti's amendment, all those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. On Councillor Nunziata's amendment, all those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. On Councillor Morley's amendment, all those in favor? Any opposed? And that is carried. And on Councillor Peruzza's amendment. Uh, all those in favor, any opposed, and that is carried. And on the item, nope, the clerk advises, we're done. So, um, Councillor Peruzza, you've got an item that was added to the agenda, EY 5.17. Give me a second, I'll get the title. Uh, no stopping on Muir Avenue. Uh, any questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Peruzza to speak. Uh, it's a, it's a, a bit of a problematic street. Uh, there's some safety concerns here, and uh, um, I, I'm hoping that uh, that we can take a look at that and, and deal with it. There's uh, you know cars lining up on both sides. Is this anyway? It, it's yeah, self-evident. Thank you. Councillor Peruzza moves the recommendations in the letter. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. And we're going to go back to the one pending item. Uh, that we were able to confirm is within the jurisdiction of the EYCC. And that is EY 5.9, compulsory stop control. The Elms at Vista Humber Drive uh, has been amended to read Ward 2. Uh, I'll move the staff recommendations. All those in favor? Any opposed? That item is carried. And we have some um, bylaws. Uh, move that the bills 445 to 447 and 449 prepared for the May 15, 2023 meeting 5 of the Etobicoke York Community Council be declared as bylaws and passed subject to section 226.9 of the City of Toronto Act 2006. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Councillor Crisanti? Yeah, uh, Microphone? I'm happy to move that uh, the confirmatory bills to confirm the legislative proceedings of the Etobicoke York Community Council acting under delegated authority at meeting five on May 15th, 2023 be declared as bylaws and passed subject to section 226.9 and the City of Toronto Act 2006. All those in favor, any opposed, that carries. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>